Hi everyone. Spencer. It's been a while since I came back to the Science Center actually. I think the last time I was here on site. I don't know. <laughs> I was playing the exhibits and all stuff, stuff like that. Are so you <laughs> probably. <laughs> they do all these like mass excursions. So, um, so I'm Spencer. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. So I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Keyword. <coughs> so we actually focus on chat automation for enterprises and government. And today, I'd love to share with you guys a little bit more about building a micro AI company in 2017. So by micro AI, I think you guys be like, what is micro AI? Like, why is it not an AI company? So I think the way that I personally just define that is essentially a smaller subset, essentially an applied AI company focused on solving a more niche problem within the entire sphere of you know, whatever you can do, from Im image recognition to QA, whatever that is, right? So I think maybe let me start by introducing ourselves um, for, for me and my company people. So we started about two years ago in Singapore, out of college. I was working at Twitter back then. So I was spending the day in, in the office. And then after dinner, we would spend you know, the night at Block 71 working on like, you know, solutions, working on products. And I think our first product back then was actually a product called Graphiter. So it's like a collaboration tool. And then since then, about more than a year ago, we started moving into chat automation. We went out to San Francisco, we did accelerators like AngelPad based in New York. And we started working with a lot of other you know, companies, uh, customers, and so on. So right now, we work with the government of Singapore on chat, chat automation. We also work with other enterprises in e-commerce, in financial services, as well as um, pharmaceuticals and healthcare. So really trying to you know, broaden the applications and look at how can we automate you know, chat conversations. So when it comes to, you know, so what I'd love to do today is just you know, in my short sharing, to share more about you know, what, is that, what exactly is happening. And I'm sure you guys have read the headlines around the world about AI and so on. But really, what can we do as individuals? Right? Whether you're working for a company you know, today, or whether you are you know, graduated, or whether you are already running a company. Like, what are some of the things that you can possibly do um, to in introduce AI solutions into your product or to build an entirely AI-focused company. And then, of course, how to get started with the micro part, like for example, product, you know, data, and so on. So let's jump in. So I think if you look at, you know, like, it's really hard nowadays when you read TechCrunch or when you read any of these like, news blogs not to chance upon the word AI, right? It's like everyone just kind of adds AI to anything, like you know, AI for, for transportation, AI for classes, AI for whatever, right? So I think if you Google all these different trends and you keep up with it, it's really, really difficult. But I think for us, you know, what we like to think about is how, what are the, some of the interesting things that really happen? And I think you know, the AI development has been pretty exciting. I think if you look at systems like Libertas, they actually managed to beat a couple of like, really professional, like no limit heads up poker players, right? And the challenge with poker is that it's actually an imperfect information game. So it's actually pretty amazing um, as compared to Go or Chess, where it's actually a perfect information game. So I think the great thing is that they actually chose this format of game, which is no limit hold um, And of course, Heads Up, which is a little bit more compliant. I think uh, the next challenge for them could be to use the same system or a different system to solve maybe like you know, multi multiplayer sort of poker. That would be more exciting. So of course, 1.7 million is a very significant amount after playing for 120,000 hands. I'm not sure how these people actually survived, but you know, <laughs> that's up to anyone to guess. And of course, uh, in the AI space right now, you know, the big companies are acquiring a lot of smaller companies. So I think one of the reasons why that, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense is because you know, some of these smaller teams, they have very strong execution capabilities or they have very strong research capabilities. And then if you look at, you know, can they bring a massive solution to market with massive amount of users? Probably not. But if they work with, for example, let's say um, Amazon or Microsoft, you know, they can potentially sort of you know, allow their applications or their systems to be able to be used by tons of like, you know, companies, users, and so on. And I think this year itself, we're definitely seeing a lot of more developments as well. So some of the logos that has already been recently acquired is not on the list. But yeah, just a sense of how things are. And, uh, and of course, I think you know, in our space of chat automation and so on, we see that in the last one year, there's been a lot of developments, primarily really due to a couple of the messaging platforms you know, and enterprise setting on this whole chatbot that, um, work, right? So I think the first thing that happened was um, you know, Facebook launched the Messenger platform last year in April at F8. And then since then, we've seen about, I think it's probably now 40,000-ish bots in the market from bots by big brands to like, smaller companies and so on. And I think, mm, in general, we've seen some really good experiences. For me, I spent one weekend, three days, talking to about 250 chatbots on Messenger. 
And after that, I just like don't want to talk to anyone bots for like a week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, like very really interesting experiences from like dating bots to like you know news bots and stuff. So it's just like yeah, it's interesting. And of course, in the self-driving car side, you know you see a lot of uh, great advancements and really nice that you know we do have a company in Singapore who's at least located in Singapore and doing interesting things as well in the economy. And of course, for the self-driving car side, you know there's problems like image recognition to you know the street rules and regulations and all these kind of things that needs to be considered. And of course, there's a lot of business problems as well, like regulators and so on. So of course, you know as People in, in the audience, like, you know, as well as myself, like, do we just sit back and wait for like, the companies to just like introduce tons of great solutions, Alexa, or whatever that is? Or can we do something about it, right? So I think I like to think that the latter is possible, meaning we can actually build some meaningful products in the space to help some people. And uh, you know, just to cite an example of how some people took it to a really strong extreme, so this group of guys, uh, I think three or four people at uh, this NIPS conference, actually create a sort of a concept called Rocket AI and they, and they, they dubbed it as you know, this next generation technology temporal recurring optimal learning. No one knows what that means, right? And some people during the conference were like quitting it out and everything and like, you know, they like made a huge hoo-ha about it. And guess what? It's all a hoax, right? As you guys probably already know. But the numbers speak for themselves, right? So what happened was after like, I think during the conference, they were able to get a you know, party going on with like 300 people attending. They even had a police attend the event and you know, like, of course, the amount of value, the amount of people that, I mean, it's ridiculous to think that investors actually reached out to invest in the company, like five of them. And you know, of course, like a lot of people were like sending in resumes and all that kind of things, right? And you think about a typical sponsorship at an event like that, it's like $10,000. And these guys spent like 500 bucks and they got like a huge amount of like interest, right? And whatever they're doing. So I don't know if this is the best way to build a company. Uh, <laughs> probably not, right? Because like, you know, if more of these kind of things go on, then I think people are just gonna call AI like a, a blob or something, right? It's not a good idea. So I think maybe just to default back to someone who actually knows what he's doing after incubating so many companies at Y Combinator, I think Paul Graham you know, stated a pretty good point, which is you, know, you need to start, instead of thinking about problems, like thinking up problems out of thin air, you need to start noticing problems around you. Right, so one of the things, you know, just to give an example, if let's say, for example, you have a friend, a farmer, who is um, doing a lot of agriculture, and every single, uh, every single day, he has to go and check the weather forecast, and he has to, you know, do his own manual telemetry <coughs> on the soil and stuff, just to make sure that his plants are healthy. You know, if, that, if you notice that problem, what you can do is potentially use a solution to essentially maybe like draw some APIs, you know, call it and automatically predict whether, hey, what is going on? So I think those are some of the things that, you know, as individuals, you know, when we see problems around us, we can potentially find solutions to help these people with the problems. And of course, I think this teenager from, um, from England, I think, did a pretty good job. So he, of course, received a lot of parking tickets for some reason, and he built a chatbot where, you know, essentially he can help people to automatically appeal for those uh, parking tickets. So I think the interesting thing about those kind of use cases is that they, he, really, he really took it to like, hey, this is the problem that I have, and then he figured out all the automatable parts of like, for example, the website and the responses and so on, and how people automatically do that, right? And after he has achieved a certain level of results, he's not stopping that, right? He's taking that on to the next step by looking at for the, um, applying the same methodology, the same concept, to helping you know, refugees who are seeking asylum you know, escape from the home country, which is amazing. So I think if you think about you know, all these kind of you know, solutions, like individuals like that from Stanford, for example, can, if, if they can do something like that, I don't see why we can't, right? So that's really how. So right now, if you guys are kind of interested in, like, for example, building something now or something, usually what are, the some of, um, what are some of the things that you guys would think about? You would be like, hey, how do I get customers? Or how do I actually build the actual product? How do I go to market after the product is built, right? Is it going to be Facebook ads? Is it going to be viral marketing, whatever it is. And also, like, how do I assemble a team? Right? Am I going to find my college buddies? Am I going to find you know, my friends from school? What would that be? And then, of course, the launch, right? Are you going to be, is it going to be a local solution? Is it going to be regional? Or is it going to be local? Right? So all these questions kind of come in once you start thinking about all these kind of questions. Once you identify the problem you're going to solve, once you realize that, hey, you're really passionate about it, these are some of the things. And I think maybe just for me to highlight a little bit more about the product side of things for micro AI company. Really, I think for product is one of the most important things. Like once you've de decided all these other things, which of course all the startup books or whatever teaches you, then the product side is really, I think, a little bit different from AI company's perspective. So I think to quote Mr. Andrew Wong, 
he's really good at um, consolidating that to, to simplifying you know, the, the product perspective from to, to two sentences, right? So I think to share what he said was, essentially, if someone asks what are AI products good for, there are a couple of things that they're really good for. And I think one of them is, it's able to help us to be able to solve problems that humans can potentially do in less than a second. So it could be, for example, showing a person an, an, an image of a cat, and a person can instantly tell, hey, this is a cat, right, or a dog, for example. But let's say, for example, it's a task that even a person with a medical degree with, like, you know, after looking at a problem for 100, for one hour with, like, multiple data sources and so on, is still not able to figure out, then, you know, AI system, yes, can augment that, but it may not be good at, you know, actually making the <coughs> correct decision, right? So I think um, we, we are seeing a lot of applications, you know, from various um, degrees of complexity, and I think the easiest ones, you know, are those that, you know, can be solved by humans in less than one second. And then, of course, predictive tasks. So we see that, you know, we see these applications, you know, in many areas. We see, for example, Facebook, you know, surfacing the most relevant content, or whatever you call it, that you will most likely click on, and they tend to be busted articles for some reason. And then, um, you know, of course, the content that sales for us are you know, applying it potentially to lead scoring, right? like using all this data that you have to be able to figure out, hey, is the person going to convert? Is the company going to convert to become a paying customer? So I think, th bearing this in mind, you know, these are some of the good frames to think about if you want to think about problems that you want to apply for today in whatever you're doing. And then it's really about how to get started. So I think, you know, the idea is that you want to get more users, right? But once you have more users, these users are going to generate a ton of data on your application or service, right? They're going to click a lot, they're going to share a lot, they're going to do a lot of actions. And then, of course, with this data that you have, you can essentially, you know, design experiments, you can design algorithms, you can design systems to be able to see how you can potentially do predictive tasks or, you know, all these kind of interesting things you can do. And then by servicing relevant, more relevant content, by servicing more relevant things, then of course you might be able to get a better product. And the better product, hopefully, you'll get more users. And it's really what everyone can achieve. So I think with this loop, um, that's how we think about you know, chat automation or any of these products as well. <coughs> so let's dive into the data part. So for data, I think every, every company and every company, like for example, startup or a big company has, you know, has a ton of data everywhere. But it's really about how do you kind of sort of prepare you know, and understand that the data sharing is pretty important. So the first part is you know, potentially understanding where the data is going to come from. Right? Is it going to be from the application? Is it going to be from you know, your offline services, your offline machines, and so on? And then it's about ingesting the data into your, into, your, into, your, into your database, for example, and then preparing the data. So preparing data, you, know, you can also like, label the data. You can figure out how to transform the data as well after that. And then it's about how do you then publish the data to you know, different kind of sources and of course, a lot of services and stuff and people to consume the data. So now that you have kind of formed a data strategy, then you want to kind of collect more data, right? Bring more data into the system. And I think a lot of people um, that we have seen just go to companies and say, hey, give me all the data. I'm going to do a lot of magic with it. And you know, you're going to get this X amount of improvements in sales, revenues, or cost savings, whatever it is. I don't think it's a good way to actually show results, even though I think some of those sales pitches do get through. But I think at the end of the day, there's many things that as a company you can do if you just don't have enough data, right? So I think this one type of job scope is recurring and coming up right now. It's called AI trainers. I don't think many people call it AI trainers, um, but that we do see some companies do that. So like XRAI, they are a calendar scheduling app. I think they have a very blatant job posting on their interlinked profile. They say AI trainers. Essentially, this, if you look at a job scope, it's people who go in and label data. It's like mechanical terms. <coughs> so if you think about it, for this kind of job requirements, yes, you can have people do it in-house, or you can do it via an outsourced agency, or you can have people you know, someone else doing that, you know, either through mechanical terms or so on. By the end of the day, the purpose of having people label data is so that you can essentially generate more um, sources for your, for, your, for your prediction engine to be, to be better. Right? And after you have done that, then only I think the, the output would be more significant. Another way that some companies actually do it is, like, so say for example, for Clarify, they are an image recognition company for um, as an API service. So what they do is that, of course, they sell to enterprises, but you know, when they do that, sometimes they, they don't have enough data. So they actually spun out an application called Forevery. What it does is that it allows people to upload photos, tag them, and stuff. And of course, they try to make it a nice user experience. So a lot of people started doing that. 
And then they started doing that. They essentially were able to capture all these tagged photos, and this helped them to improve their product on the back end so that they can generate more revenue from enterprises. So we're seeing this quite common, and of course, you probably see it with like, you know, Capture and other different systems. And of course, you know, sometimes you know, after you answer a question or uh, after you do something, someone asks, ask, is this relevant, right? yes or no? So all these kind of like set of, um, I would say data traps, but maybe like just traps, just like systems where it help you to capture user input, it's actually very useful for data generation. Yeah. And of course, I think right now we're seeing a huge movement for public data sets, right? Like, you know, if you look at telephone competitions, if you look at, you know, the open data movement, or, or, if, or if you look at companies, you know, open sourcing some of the data sources and stuff. I think a great thing about that is that it means that you don't have to start from zero when you are thinking about designing a system, right? And you can, there's a lot of interesting purposes of data that you can play with. For example, if you're designing a email automation software company, you can potentially use the Enron email corpus. I'm not sure if um, that will make your, make your system good. But at the end of the day, you will have enough data sources to at least get started immediately. And say, for example, if you're building a chatbot that tells you the bus timings, like bus angle, the good thing is that you can actually now use the APIs from the LTA and all these other agencies in the Singapore government, for example, to be able to get the bus timings. And by doing so, you are able to then provide a good service for the user you know, by focusing on the personality and focusing on these other things. So I think that's pretty interesting. And hopefully more and more you know, governments, more and more companies would share more of the data sources so that, of course, you know, um, independent companies can, can do more with it. And I think we've seen companies, like let's say for example, if you can get all the data in the world, great. But in many cases, like for example, if you are trying to solve problems in like medical imaging or like cancer research or something like that, you may, you may be in a very specific domain field that is very difficult to get access to open data sources or, you know, or generate data. So what you can do is you can pick a narrower domain, right? So in, let's say for example, in emails, in emails case, there's, there's emails about every single topic in the world, but you can solve every single problem from like proposal sending to whatever. So I think what Xbox AI did was pretty good was that they actually focused on a narrow domain, which is email scheduling. So instead of burning a forest on every single thing, they just picked one set of trees and they just tried to be exhausted to them. So I, I, I was recently um, at a talk where Dennis, the CEO of Xbox AI was at, and he shared that they, at, at this point right now, they have essentially exhausted every single way that someone can ask to schedule a calendar in right? <coughs> So I think by being comprehensive in one narrow domain, it actually provides you the capability to have more data around it, which is really exciting. Yeah. So we'll see where this goes, right? Right now there's a there's a battle in this like email bot space with like XRI, you know, calendar help, you know, in Singapore Mimata and so on. So so we'll see. And of course I think we have seen some companies being very innovative and generating data automatically, which is a really good idea. Right. So say for example, if you're, a, if you're trying to build a self-driving car system and you don't have enough like, nighttime driving you know, data, what you can potentially do is to log on to GTA and not play the game, but you know, generate, you know, essentially have the car just drive around automatically and generate lots of data based on the game environment and so on. I think, of course, if you want to generalize that to real world driving, you do have to factor in other things, but you know, it's a really good way to at least experiment with certain other parts of the system, right? If, for example, the real world environment is not super important. But of course, now game engines are getting to a point where you can actually mimic entire the real world, so it's getting pretty interesting. And of course, we've seen companies, I think Facebook, they also use um, this data generation um, strategy to essentially take a paragraph of text, remove one word, and then use that as a training data engine at, um, for, for systems. Essentially to find if, hey, um, are you able to comprehend the paragraph and then fill in the blanks in the middle, right? So I think these are good examples of how you can potentially generate data automatically from, for example, existing data sets that you already have. And then I think at the end of the day, for once you have all this data, you have you've picked the domain, you have done all these great things, it's all about fast iterations, right? It's not just about you know, beaching bench, uh, being benchmarks, but it's also about, hey, how can you provide a service to people and how do you actually you know, experiment and deploy and publish? So I mean, one of the examples of you know, a framework that you can think about using is maybe the TensorFlow serving. And it really allows us to do more experimentation and also um, you know, and be able to deploy faster. So I think that's something that, you know, of course, you'll see more and more of such frameworks coming up. So that's very really exciting. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think the way that um, we think about it for us is really that, hey, AI has, there's many various applications for AI systems today, right? And I think if you break down this, um, this 
flash sort of AI into all these different components um, is really meaningful, and I think it can provide a lot of benefit for a lot of people in, in different industries. And then, of course, you know, I think the available tools that we have right now is pretty mature. And you know, if you are interested in solving any of these problems, you can actually start today almost. And of course, you know, building better products in the AI space is really about getting more data sources, right? Getting more data or picking a narrow domain, all these kind of interesting things that you can do. And I think coming back to what I was talking about earlier, which is you know, building a micro AI company, it's not just about the product, right? It's also about these other things. So I can share maybe just like two anecdotes about you know, what we have sort of personally experienced uh, in terms of like how that has been. So from a team perspective, we realized that you know, we needed to have a team that was not just technical, but also able to handle the different components like design, marketing, and all these other different sales perspectives, right? Because at the end of the day, we just focus on building the product, but we're not able to sell it, then we have a problem, right? And of course, you know, AI products are no different than SaaS products or any of these other software products. The way that we sell it, the way we price it, the way we lock it, it's all exactly, almost exactly the same. But the understanding on the business level, I realized on, on this product is actually pretty, pretty new still because of how nascent it still is. So there's really a lot of education that's required for us to sort of educate the client and also tell them that, hey, it's not about the buses. It's not about what is like type that people are telling you. It's really about, hey, what is the result that we can drive for the business? Right? So that's actually pretty important. And, and you need to have the right team to be able to be structured to do that. And whether it's in Singapore, whether it's in the US, whether you go to Europe, it doesn't really matter. Right? As long as the team is always working together on these problems and able to grow and, you know, and expand the team. So that's kind of been a pretty interesting part of our journey. And then I think about the global part. So we realized that after going to the US, the reason why automation in the US is very meaningful and very, very looked upon is probably also because the cost of labor in the US is pretty high. So it costs a lot to actually hire people to be able to, like, for example, do customer support, do sales, and so on. So as a result, they either outsource that or they try to look at automation opportunities. But in terms of Southeast Asia, I think we do see that you know, that, is, um, that is still not at the same level in terms of need as, as the US. So it's interesting how the contrast in the markets work as well. And also, you know, in terms of the environment, then we can deploy solutions. So I think that's some of the you know, sort of very <coughs> real things that we, we have encountered. And I think, so, so I think just to wrap it up, you know, building a micro AI company, is, it is about, of course, having a really interesting problem that you're solving. It's really about trying to build a really good product. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of other things as well, you know, when it comes to building a company that we need to really you know, sort of solve. And it's really about solving those problems every single day. And hopefully getting to a point where you can be in position for hype. So, of course, if you guys are, you know, working for companies, hope you guys take something back to, like, you know, solve something. And of course, for us, you know, if you guys are really interested in question and answer problems, very interested in NLP, come talk to me. Um, you can send me an email as well. So we, we we are trying to really focus on the chat automation problem and uh, really excited about what's going to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Most companies, like especially if you look at it from a B2B space, are looking for very specific chatbots to solve specific questions. So with you as a company, if you're, if you're planning to build a system like this, would you host each one of them in a different way, or would you aggregate all the data so that the rest of your chatbots also get smarter? So would that be a good thing to do, or would that be a bad Okay. That's actually a really good question. So you, you, so you said about the, so every company has kind of, kind of a different need, right? Um, I think maybe to answer the question, the first part of the question, I think the first part of the question is there are definitely some specific needs, right? So for example, let's say um, maybe let's say a company in the shipping space, they have this like SMS system that uh, goes out to people, but they want to automate that, right? So they have this like specific need and they need to be on-premise, they need to be on private cloud and so on. And then you have another company who may be an e-commerce company who needs it to be a post-purchase shipping experience, right? So definitely we are getting, we are seeing that there's a lot of like different kind of requirements from different kind of industries in this space, right? I think at the end of the day, what is what we realize about this, there are some things that are customized, so we look at the integration partners and this kind of stuff, but there's some things that are very common, which is actually the FAQ part. So the frequently asked questions are the questions that are essentially, how do you train the models to be able to understand what the user is saying and then actually answer the question? That actually is something that everyone sort of needs, but at the same time, the solution is still not there yet. And also on top of that, the 
the software component, like the management piece, is where I think is very common. Everyone is analytics, everyone is audit, everyone needs all these kind of um, controls and also the deployment processes. So from a software uh, product perspective, we, do, we are able to provide that. So I think that's the that's the first part of the question, right? About hey, when you have these all these customizations, how do we then you know ensure that it's still a product and it's not just like one single deployment every single time, right? And I think the second part is then you know sort of choosing the right people to work with. So like, it's really a business problem then, right? It's like, hey, there's always going to be a ton of people pulling you in different directions, right? Then you need to kind of pick the right things to work on. So I think for us, we, we pick question, um, areas where we are interested in, unfortunately, not areas that make a lot of money. So we are interested in, for example, support, we're interested in uh, B2B to C kind of use cases. We're not exactly super interested in a B2B, entirely B2B use cases. We like that, you know, the end result of whatever we do on the chat automation side can help the people to sort of maybe have a better experience in the companies, right? So that's kind of our sort of pick, right? And when we pick that, then what happens is that it usually ends up being either a proactive sales experience or ends up being a reactive support experience. Yeah. Right. Thanks. So let's see. Maybe you know all the frameworks around chatbots, so what's the easy one to get started with? Easy one to get started? Uh, I mean, I mean, not being biased, but we are, we are Microsoft partners. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, are, we work with Microsoft. But um, I think Microsoft Bot Framework is pretty good to get started with. Um, or you can look at, you know, for example, but if you are, okay. I think Microsoft Bot Framework is pretty good, but I would recommend actually trying to, to write the chatbot in like whatever language that you are comfortable with, right? Be it not JS, be it Python, whatever. Right? Just do something that, you know, that, that is used, right? I think that's really the best way to start it. So as we build our first bot, we were like, Hey, let's just like you know write it in Node because like, we were familiar with it and just like whatever. Um, and we didn't really like use any of the frameworks out there, like for example, the Bot framework or whatever. That is, right? Because those are still very very early. So for us, I think because of that, we kind of understood how everything works. You know, from the done this component, I think that's really helpful. Yeah. Right? Instead of thinking of it as hey, I just want to deploy a bot and then let's just get the fastest way to do that, I think you you can work with companies for those kinds of stuff, right? But if you're trying to explore this yourself you want to understand the fundamental thing, then it's better for you to just have you know, sort of think of whatever you're most comfortable with. I think I'll do that. And then, um, I, I think personally, I'm really excited about voice. I'm really excited about the, the potential for um, not just messaging, right, but also yeah. voice and other internal systems as well. So I think that would be pretty exciting. Yeah. So for us, one of the experiments that we did was we launched a bot called Digest.ai. So essentially, it's a Slack summary bot that sits in Slack and summarizes the conversations and sends back to the team as a form of a digest or an email. And uh, when we launched it like last year, we were just like, oh, this is a fun project, like, don't worry. But then, uh, since then, of course, we've bought 300 companies. It's a free product, so about 300 companies, like, including like, NASA and stuff using it. So, like, oh shit, this is actually pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think the impact of us is like, you know, hey, you can actually solve real problems, not just like, you know, all these like, things that the media talks about. Mm. Yeah. 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 All right, show me if you guys have any questions. Thank you.